Hello, and welcome to Union Tabernacle. We are so excited that you are joining us in our virtual environment today. If you haven't done so already, please like our Facebook page so that you will receive a notification when we go live. Also, share this worship service and tag your friends and family so that they can join you for worship. You can also follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We love to connect with you here at UTAB. So in the comments section, go ahead and tell us where you're watching from and who's watching with you. Before service starts, we want you to know what type of church we are. Our mission is to impact the community and the world with cross-centered ministry. We do that by meeting the needs of others through outreach and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are a purpose-driven church built on the five purposes of ministry, evangelism, discipleship, worship, and fellowship. We place great value in the next generation and we are a church that loves to give. Welcome to UTAB. Everybody, we come to lift the name of Jesus up because he's worthy and he's all we need. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're all I need, every breath you breathe through me. You're all I need, let your rivers flow me. You're all I need. Every breath you breathe through me. Oh, you're all I need. Let your rivers flow through me. You're all I need. You're all I need. You're all I need. All I need. Come on, from your home, sing with us. 
your discipleship opportunities for May. Wednesday mornings, Pastor Carter hosts a prayer and devotional call on our prayer conference line at 6 a.m. Join us for a midweek tune-up. Sunday mornings, our Christian Education Department meets for their discipleship hour with Sunday school at 9 a.m. on Zoom. Our morning worship starts at 10.15 a.m. This month, our in-person worship services will be on Sunday, May 9th and Sunday, May 23rd. Registration links will be made available for you to join us in person and the remaining Sundays will be virtual. Hello and greetings to you, the Sisterhood of Union Tabernacle. We want to invite you to join us as we continue our journey in studying Master Life. We have covered the excitement of spending time with the Master, living in the Word, and now our third session 
We are looking forward to growth as we study how to pray in faith. Please join us as we develop our relationships with each other and with the Master for a time of sharing and growing together. We meet the third Saturday of the month at 10 a.m. via the Zoom platform. That'll be Saturday, May 15, 2021 at 10 a.m. Thank you, God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you there. Oh, come on and stand to your feet and let's give God some praise in this place today. I don't know about you, but I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I am glad to be in the sanctuary one more time to give our God praise, for he alone is worthy to be praised. So I'm going to ask that you do this favor with me. Let us make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the land, let us serve the Lord with gladness as we come before his presence with singing, for we know that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves, for we are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. Therefore, we enter his gates with thanksgiving. Come on, open up your mouth and give God some praise right there. We enter his gates with thanksgiving. We come into his courts with praise. We're thankful unto him, and we bless his name. Because the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. We are so glad, we are so glad that we have this opportunity to partnership together in worship, both in the sanctuary and in our virtual space. We're so glad that you on our, our online guests have joined in with us today. And we just simply ask that, if you, that you will feel free to share this broadcast to write a line in the, com in the comment section and participate in worship with us because we serve a great and awesome God. And he is truly worthy, he is worthy to be praised. Eternal great God, our Father, we thank you right now. As we move forward in this worship service, we pray right now for your participation in our worship, Father. We ask right now that you take our pastor and hide him behind the shadow of your cross so that, that as your word is preached to us, our lives are changed and transformed, that we may hear your word, that our lives will be, our hearts will be renewed and our minds will be restored, our broken hearts will be mended again, Father, and that you will lift up our countenance, Father. We thank you right now for what you're getting ready to do. And we pray that your word will take root in our hearts, that we may remember it all the days of our lives so that we can live according to it and teach others what we have learned. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give our God praise once again for this opportunity to worship together. Hallelujah. How many know that God has truly been carrying them throughout this season, this season of being in a pandemic? I just can't thank him for enough for carrying us over. He has truly been our strength. And if you know that God has been your strength, especially in difficult times, you ought to take this time to lift your hands and truly be grateful and just thank him for being your strength, a strength that is like no other, a solid rock on which you stand. Hallelujah. And God, we just thank you for being our strength.
God from your homes and even in the sanctuary, you ought to help me say, you are my strength, God, you're my strength, strength like no other. that God has lifted them up over and over. You lift me up oh, in the fullness of your grace, in the power of your name. You lift me up. God, you lift me up.
bow with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you this morning first thanking you for being sufficiently strong for all of us. Thank you that you are the source of our strength. You are the strength of our lives. So we lift this praise up to you. God, I pray even right now that you would stand in my body and think with my mind, speak with my tongue. Block every plan and scheme the enemy has for this worship service this day. Fall fresh upon me. Spirit of the living God, break me, melt me, and mold me to what you would have me to do. Take my mind, think for me. Take my mouth, speak for me. For Lord, if you don't speak, Sinners can't be saved. If you don't speak, saints won't be encouraged. If you don't speak, deliverance can't take place. And so, God, we need you even now to speak, Lord Jesus. We, your people, are listening. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness and then use me for your glory and our good is our prayer in the powerful and perfect name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Continuing our sermonic journey through the book of Galatians, let me, as you turn to Galatians chapter 4, verse 21, let me say a word of welcome to those who have joined us online and in person. Thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for waking up and getting out of bed. I pray you have gotten dressed, gotten your Bible, seated at your table. And study the word of God with us. Worship with us. Say amen with us. I pray that you've been, already been blessed by the songs of Zion sung in this place this day. I want to thank our music ministry for the excellent um, selections of music this morning, the encouragement to me. I feel all right. Amen. Too often we take for granted people who do a good job because they are consistent, but I do not want to be guilty of that. I want to say thank you to all who make it possible for me to stand um, and preach and not be worried about the details. Verse 21, I'm going to read the rest of the chapter, verse 21 through 31, from the English Standard Version of the Bible. There in the reading, the word of God is this. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. The son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear Break forth and cry aloud. 
you who are not in labor for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. This is the word of God. As you take your seats, I want to lay with a message. Who's your mother? Who's your mother? One of the things that I've been told I'm good at is sermon illustrations. My ability to tell stories that help people see and understand difficult things come natural to me. The point of an illustration is to make the point clearer to the hearer. One way of illustrating is to use that which is familiar to those to whom I am preaching to so that they can access clearly a picture so that they will be able to apply that picture to the principle. Stories about my children are my favorite. As you know, I use them fairly regularly in my sermons. However, there are times when grabbing an illustration from the Bible can be very impactful. There are times where you can take a different story from the Bible that highlights and illustrates the point of a different passage. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul here in this section is doing. He has done it earlier in this letter by applying the, the principles of grace and law to the Mosaic covenant against the covenant that was given to Abraham. Previously, he was talking about Abraham as the father of the faith and now he moves from discussing or using rather Abraham as an illustration to using his wife Sarah and his son Isaac. Let me, let me lay the groundwork for you so that you can access this story and read it for yourself when you get a chance. The, the Galatian Christians are falling into legalism. They are suffering bondage of living according to the law. Paul had already suffered greatly and travailed for them in their first birth as children of God. Now he does it again. In this book, Paul is telling them, I have already travailed on your behalf in order that you would come to faith in Jesus Christ by grace alone. And now you are going back as if to re-enter the womb again into immature activities and understanding. Since the Judaizers, those who had sneaked into the faith and started to pull the understanding of the people of God down, were so biblical, Paul wants to make sure that he confronts them in a way that they can understand as well. Paul accepts their biblical challenges and uses the law to prove that Christians are under the grace of God, not under the law. He takes the familiar story of Ishmael and Isaac 
from Genesis chapter 16 through 21. You, when you get a chance, you ought to read this saga. Don't watch uh, some of the shows that come on TV if you're looking for a good and entertaining drama series. Just take a few hours and read through Genesis chapter 16 through 21. You ought to binge read the Bible sometime. I wish I had somebody who understand that. And draws on that familiar story basic truths that we can apply today. These events described actually happened. Paul is talking about something that was written in the Old Testament scriptures that they would have read and known. Paul is aware of this and he wants to make sure to give them that which they already understand and apply it so that they can live as free people and not as people of bondage. Paul uses Genesis in this section. And he, he does it in order to highlight allegorically. Let me say a moment about allegory, that it is to apply spiritual truth behind a hidden message from another place. And we have to be careful now that you can't allegorize everything in the Bible. Paul here is under divine uh, inspiration of the Spirit of God in order to take the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and apply it to how the Galatian church has misunderstood the difference between law and grace. Are y'all with me? I want to make sure that you understand Paul is not just spiritualizing in order to get a shout out of the people. Paul is spiritualizing in order to take that which was familiar to them and apply it to their situation so that they can live as free people, not as people of bondage. Let me, let me lay ground groundwork. We're going we're gonna to track through Abraham's calling all the way up until the time when Isaac was born. At, at 75, Abraham was called by God from Ur of the Chaldees to go to a city that God was showing. We know that city to be Canaan. God was waiting until both Abraham and Sarah were as good as dead so that they could not take credit for what God was getting ready to do. At 85, 10 years later, Sarah, still barren, unable still to bear children, gets impatient and tries to help God. She, she says, I'm not going to hold up that which God has promised, so let me help. Now listen, let me pause here parenthetically to say to you, don't help God. He don't need your help. When you help God, you end up with Ishmael. You end up living beneath the God-given privilege that he has for you. But you should make sure to trust God and wait on God to fulfill that which God alone has promised. At 85, Sarah tries to help God. She sends old man Abraham in to, to Hagar. And, and as you can imagine, uh, Abraham did not refuse. <laughs> Lord have mercy. His wife told him, you could have another woman so that you could have a baby with him. Abraham probably Probably was smiling on the inside try as he goes in to Hagar and makes a baby that baby of promise was born when Abraham was 86 years old at 86 Hagar gets pregnant and Sarah is mad she's ready to put her out but God forbids her in Genesis chapter 16 at 99 watch it now at 86 Ishmael is born at 99, God comes back to Abraham and restates to Abraham that he was going to give him a son. When Sarah heard uh, God tell Abraham that he was going to give him a son through her womb, she huh, laughed. Lord, have mercy. Uh, and, and God probably uh, checked her on her laughter saying that I can't believe you're going to laugh that I, did I say something funny? God said, did I say something funny? And, 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 and listen, let me tell you what happened. They named the baby a year later when she gets pregnant and has the baby. God huh, 
says, name the baby Isaac. Isaac's name means laughter. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Listen, what, what you got to understand is that God at times will give you a blessing that will blow your mind to the point where you start laughing. And Isaac is a reminder that God is not limited by your limitations. I'm just telling the background story now. I haven't started preaching this text. I just need you to understand that one so you can understand this one. At 103, huh, it was customary for Jews to wean their children about the age of three to make a great occasion out of it. The feast. At the feast, Ishmael makes fun of Isaac in Genesis chapter 21 to create trouble in their home. Now let me pause here for a moment and talk to the real sisters who can really identify with what's going on. We got a 14 year old and a one year old in the same house. We have two different baby mamas living in the same house. One is the child of the flesh, the other one is the child of the promise. And Abraham has a difficult decision, but the decision is not his, it's God's. God says, you got to let her go. <laughs> Lord, that God at times will allow you to live with the, 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 the issues of your flesh, but there are times when God himself will say to you, it's time to let him go. And this is what Paul is saying in this section, that it's time for you to let them go. He is trying to tell them that there are times in all of our lives when we are tempted to lean towards legalism. We are tempted to love Ishmael in the language of the text and reject Isaac. We, when, whenever you live according to the law as if it guarantees you some access to God, you are living like Ishmael, not like Isaac. And I'm trying to help you today because we are recommitted to the gospel. And the gospel is the only way that you and I can be, can be made right before God is that Jesus Christ on the cross took on the punishment that we deserve so that you and I get to go to heaven in order to, to receive eternal life. On the surface, the story appears to be nothing more than a tale of family drama. But here Paul lets us know that beneath the surface there are meanings and significant references that carry power for Abraham and his two wives and his two sons and you and I. Are you interested today? Here's what I stood to tell you in this moment. Because we are born again children of the promise, we should live by grace and not by law. It's not deep. I actually have restated the same claims of the rest of this chapter because Paul in this chapter is saying one thing. He keeps saying it over and over again. He just said last week, y'all gonna make me lose my mind up in here. And he wants them to know that you can't live by law and grace at the same time. They don't work together. You either are saved by grace or you are not. The text breaks down very simply in three little sections. I'll make sure you understand it, but I want you to follow me as we track the contrasting ideas that Paul uses in this text in order to make sure that the people of the church in Galatia knew that you are crazy if you want to live in bondage when you have already been set free. Verse 21, he lays out his proposition. Paul wants them to know in verse 21, let me read it for you. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? Paul wants them to know that you can't be saved by keeping the law because you can't keep it perfectly. The law itself says 
Failure to commit just one is to commit all of them. If you mess up just one time and miss just one command of God, then you are guilty of all of them. And you can't do anything to undo the wrong that you do every day except to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, you got to be kidding me. The law does not work anymore. Paul writes directly both to those who promote legalism and those who have succumbed to legalism. We, he writes to those who, watch it, desire to be under the law, living under the law, keeping on the basis of their relationship with God. Who would desire to be under the law when you have been given free grace? Y'all ain't hear me. I, let, me, let, me let me make sure y'all get it. Uh, if I gave you a McDonald's gift certificate for $25 and you go to McDonald's and you order uh, $25 worth of McDonald's and then you reach in your pocket and pay cash for it, that doesn't make any sense. You got a, you got a free gift in your pocket. All you have to do is lay the free gift on the table and the McDonald's is yours. And this is what Paul is saying. How can you have a free gift certificate of grace in your pocket and you want to go back and try to pay for it with your behavior? It just doesn't make any sense. He says, who desires to be, watch it, under the law? That is to suggest who wants to be under the authority, the jurisdiction of the law? Whose life wants to be guided and governed by 613 rules by which no one has been able to keep perfectly and we are all guilty of all of them except we have placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says you don't want to be under the law. Under the law, we, we find ourselves like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden taking fig leaves and trying to cover our own sins but no you have not had to cover your own sins with fig leaves but rather it is because God the Father took God the Son and sacrificed him on the cross of Calvary that you and I can now come boldly to the throne of grace and that we may obtain mercy and favor to help in our time of need how can you try to earn that? Paul said, don't make sense. How are you going to live according to the law and you have been given the free gift of grace? Paul senses that his point has been clear. He, 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 he basically pulls a Pastor Carter. He said, let me put the cookies on the bottom shelf so everybody can eat. Paul wants to make sure that in this next section, he gives an illustration. He had a proposition first in verse 1, but then he illustrates. Here is what Paul says in verses 22 through 27. Let me, let me read them for you. For it is written that Abraham, who had two sons, was one by a slave woman, one by the free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born according to the promise. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. Watch the comparisons now. One, one from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar was at Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem. She is in slavery with her children. Hmm. Lord have mercy. But Jerusalem is free, and she, Sarah, is our mother. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me see if I can't help you with this, because at the end of the day, failure to understand what Paul is illustrating can cause you to be living uh, under the law as well. And I don't want you to, he contrasts at least six things in this text. Now, but, but let me just walk you through it. First, Paul, Paul contrasts real Christianity versus legalism. Abraham's first son was named Ishmael. He was born not from his wife, but from his wife's servant, a bondwoman, a slave. This woman worked for Abraham and Sarah. She was 
Sarah's handmaid. She, she, she took care of Sarah on a daily basis. And Sarah said, listen, I want you to take a break from taking care of me, and I want you to go take care of my husband. And her husband gladly agreed. The, the first contrast is that, that that which is between freedom and that which is slavery. One of the sons Abraham had was from a free woman, and the other one was from the slave woman. Which son of Abraham's are you? If you don't mind, I, I just want to suggest that, that Abraham still has two sons walking up and down through the church, through our society. One is living according to legalism, and the other one is living according to grace. My question, again, is which one of Abraham's sons are you? Ishmael was born Abraham's first son. But he was a son, according to the, the text says, according to the flesh, unbelief, trying to make your own way. Ishmael is evidence of what happens when we try to help God instead of accepting his free gift of grace. Ishmael is, is evidence that we can't get it right if we try to. Legalism does not mean the settling the setting of spiritual standards, it means worshiping these standards and thinking that we are spiritual because we can obey them. Y'all don't hear what I just said. That, that, that real, the real issue is, is not that you try to live right. The real issue is the motivation behind why you trying to live right. That you ain't holy. I don't care how holy you think you are. You ain't no good. You are a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All are in need of grace. And, and either you a grace case or you a slave. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. I said either you a, 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 a grace case or you're a slave. Abraham's second son is evidence that you can't help God. God will at times allow you to mess up. He'll allow you to go astray. But then there will come a time when God will say, like he said to Abraham, it's time to let it go. And that's what I want to tell somebody who's beaten up on themselves, who has allowed church folk to keep you away from the church, allowed church folk to make you think you're going to hell and you've called on Jesus for salvation. You need to tell them, tell them what I tell them every time they try to tell me what I got and what I do. I deserve. No, I don't. I am a grace case. Everything I have is because God gave me what I didn't deserve, not because I earned something but because of his grace. Now let me just tell you while I'm talking today that some of us have to be careful with our desire to live right. It's the motivation behind why you want to live right that should concern you. Abraham's second son, however, is named Isaac. Isaac was what you get when you wait on God to fulfill his promise. Uh, 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 Isaac is the child of promise. He is the child of, watch it now, the free woman. Uh, Isaac was Abraham's son born at 100 years old. God essentially removed all conceivable doubt as to who it was that will be responsible for, for the fulfillment of this covenant. When he gave Abraham the covenant, he made sure that Abraham understood that it is my responsibility, not yours, in order to keep this covenant. That Abraham receives what God had promised because God had promised. Second contrast here draws between Christianity and legalism is contrasted by work done by God's promised miracle and work done according to the flesh. That Ishmael is evidence of what happens with work done in the flesh. 
He is a picture now of the Galatian church's ability or attempt to live according to the Mosaic law and not according to grace. And Paul is saying, you acting like the child of the slave woman. But those who wait on God, who are, we are children of the promise. That is, that we are the children of the promise because God did all the work. I said God did all the work. You, you didn't do anything. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God lest any man should boast. God made sure you couldn't take credit for nothing because he did all the work, not you. Is your relationship with God based on your own works or on the works of God's promise to fulfill in your life? Do, do you patiently wait on God and depend on his promise or are you guilty of trying to help God out in your own life? <laughs> Who's your mama? Let me ask you a question. Who is your mama? Now, I know you can't answer the question out loud. Some of y'all is sitting, ironically, next to your mama in here today. And I want to ask you a question. Which one of these two mamas are belongs to you? Do you belong to? Do, do you belong to Hagar? Right, you know, let, me, let me tell you what Hagar's children sound like. I can't believe y'all acting that way in church. That ain't holy. That ain't holy living. I, I can't believe you, you dress like that. You're going to hell. You're going to lose your salvation because that skirt is, is too short. That, 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 shirt, that shirt shows too much. She needs to be shamed. Listen, if you are making these statements, your mama name is Hagar. You're looking at people in the sense of judgment. And y'all know we, we love to make God's the, our, our idea for God the same as our own. We'll send somebody to hell because we think they ought to go to hell. Listen, baby, if you can send somebody to hell, they're going to pull you with them. Paul wants it to be clear that he speaks using these pictures from the Old Testament. His reference to Hagar and Ishmael were pictures of those who live according to the law. They're meant to illustrate the point. Now he's going to bring in another picture. Watch this one. Uh, the, the next picture is contrast between two places. It's, 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 it's between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. Lord have mercy. In, in the Bible, a covenant, of course, is a contract. That contract is sealed in blood, and, 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 and the contract, there was two contracts, there was two covenants, there were two places. One is Mount Sinai, the other one is Mount Zion. At Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the covenant. At, at Mount Zion, he gave Abraham. And in the Bible, the covenant, the contract, Paul brings it right down to the issues confronting the church that he was talking to. He's talking to them straight to their face, in writing, of course. The legalists wanted them to relate to God under the law, under a set of rules, under the Mosaic covenant. But that, that's good. I know you're thinking. I understand all the theology, Pastor. And I know y'all must be out there thinking, he always just explaining the Bible. Won't he, won't he, I got issues. I got things that I'm dealing with. My marriage is in trouble. My finances is a mess. Why don't he preach more practical things like that which I deal with every day? Let me just tell you how Jesus addressed practical issues. In Matthew chapter number 6, you will hear him talk about take no thought for your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, about your body, what you will put on. But seek first, hey, here it is, seek first the kingdom of God and his, I, I, I'm going to stop right there, and who's his? I'm going to say it one more time just so you make sure I, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What things, Jesus? Your food, your future, your fountain, and your fashion. All of these things will be added unto you. 
But you got to, listen, you got to seek him first. <laughs> one, one covenant associated with Mount Sinai, a place where Moses received the law. The covenant that Moses received gave birth to bondage. It, it was Hagar covenant. It was, it was based on works. The, 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 Hagar is the surrogate mother who gave birth to Ishmael. It is therefore, if used improperly, according to the flesh. That is, according to your ability, not with you leaning on his ability. Let me pause here for a minute because I hear my church people, I hear y'all thinking, I hear you. Well, that's cheap grace. That's what you're thinking. Yeah, that's cheap grace. You get to live how you want to live and you still get to go to heaven. That's, that's cheap grace. Listen, let me tell you something. Ain't nothing cheap about grace. I said ain't nothing cheap about grace. Grace was purchased at a great price, but it's just free to me, baby. Don't hate on me because I got the hook up. You need to call on the name of the Lord so you can meet him for yourself. Che grace ain't cheap. It's very expensive. He paid for it with his blood. The covenant corresponds to Jerusalem, which is now. He's talking about earthly Jerusalem here. He is comparison. He is comparing uh, two mountains. Now he goes on to compare to Jerusalem. The other covenant associated with Jerusalem, the Mount Zion, is the new Jerusalem. It is, it is the heavenly Jerusalem, the one to which we aspire to go. The, the third contrast Paul draws here is between heaven and earth. Two covenants, two locations, two destinies. Paul wants to make sure that they understood that if you keep going like you're going, you, you are suffering under the bondage of slavery and you are living beneath your God-given privilege and there is no sense in you living like that. You ought to live as a grace case. This is where Paul opens the book up and he goes from talking about what you believe, now he shifts to what you, how you should behave. Now, that is to suggest that you behave properly because you have been saved, not in order to be saved. You see the difference? The, the sleight of hand can have you living in bondage, worried about impressing people when God says, my grace is sufficient for you. This Jerusalem is free. Lord, have mercy. You get to go to heaven for free. That's enough preaching right there to set the mic down and go on and shout. Because we get to go to heaven by the expensive price paid by another. Why would you go and attempt to pay for that which has been given to you? This is, this is the irony of this text. This covenant has many children. It is the mother of us all. Every Christian through the centuries belongs to the new covenant. The covenant of the heavenly Jerusalem. And every birth under that covenant is a miracle just like our elder brother Isaac. Lord have mercy. I said just like Isaac, Isaac's birth was a miracle. God waited until his mother's womb died in order to bring from a dead womb a child of promise. And, and this, is, this is the wonderful thing about salvation that God can raise up that which was formerly dead in order to bring about life. You don't believe me, do you? That's how your salvation was wrought. That God raised Jesus from the dead in order that you and I can be born again. Huh, now, he shifts here. There's a quotation in my Bible. I hope you got your good Bible with you. And it's a quotation in there where he quotes Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1. And it suggests that there will soon be more Christians than Jews, a promise that was and is fulfilled. The, the fourth contrast here Paul draws between Christianity and legalism is the contrast between, watch it, many more and many. The abundance of glory of the new covenant is shown by the fact that it would soon 
have more followers than the old covenant. That, 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 that the new covenant sealed in the blood of Jesus Christ will soon overcome that which was the former covenant. I, I, I've said it, so let me restate it, just so that you make sure that you're clear that Ishmael represents slavery and bondage. Isaac represents freedom. Ishmael rep represents that which is according to the flesh, and Isaac represents the miracle birth. Uh, Ishmael represents earthly Jerusalem, which today is no more, but Isaac represents the heavenly Jerusalem that we'll have, you and I, when we all get to heaven, that we are aspiring to go, to, but, but, but Ishmael had children. But Isaac will have many more. That, that this contrast is very significant because it leaves room for you and I to be saved. That you can become a child of Isaac. If you're listening to me today and you're out there in Facebook and you, your life seems empty and hopeless, you feel as if you're living in bondage and in slavery, let me just tell you that you can switch sides. and You can go from the many to the many more. You can join Isaac's family and make Sarah your mother and God your God, Jesus your Savior today. Final section. Verses 28 through 31 uh, is Paul going another step further in order to clarify a point that they should have already. He's just like a good preacher. He, he's closing, but in his closing, he keeps repeating himself. He, he wants to make sure that the message and the point of the illustration that he gives is clear. And what he exhorts them, finally, this exhortation. He, he has a proposition, an illustration, but now there's an exhortation using inside of it. He, he's, you'll see it. it it's, it's persecuted versus persecuting. The fifth contrast is between those two. The legal is represented by Ishmael have always, even until this day, if you look at the conflict in the Middle East, are persecuting the children of Isaac. As we walk in the glory, in the freedom, in the miraculous power of the Lord Jesus, please understand that this new covenant means that you're going to be mistreated. This is bad news. I know you don't want to hear it. You didn't come dressed up and get down here to the church for me to tell you that you're going to be persecuted. But you're going to experience hardship and persecution. This is what Paul wants to make sure that the Galatian church knows, that they don't turn away from sound doctrine and proper teaching because they are experiencing persecution. Because persecution is what he's suggesting, is evidence that your mama is Sarah and not Hagar. Uh, that, that people who come after you, people who talk about you. I, I had uh, a conversation with one of the young people from our church about a, a, a religious group, I'll call them, a religious group that went on our Facebook page and, and went through our church website and began to, to shoot holes or, or to poke fun at what we believe, our articles of faith. They, they said it wasn't this, it didn't have that, it didn't have this, it didn't have that. And, and, and you can ask these young people, I'm not going to tell you their name because you don't need to know, but here's the thing, you could ask them, when they told me, I smiled. <laughs> you know why I smile? Because the evidence that I'm being persecuted is proof that I belong to God. I must be doing something right. If they are persecuting me, I ain't studying, studying about them. I ain't thinking about them. I'm trying to preach the Bible, get the gospel story right, save God's people to the best of my ability. Why would you be persecuting me? Why are you trying to attack my members? i tell you why. Because my mama's name ain't Carolyn, it's Sarah. Lord have mercy. That, 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 that our, our, our persecution is evidence that, that we belong to God. Too often, we think because we're going through, it means that you've done something wrong. It's not that you've done something wrong. It's that you belong to the Lord. You have been, watch it now, joined into the fellowship of his suffering. Being made conformable to the image of his son. Listen, I'm going to tell you that your persecution, it ought to make you shout. 
because it's proof. It's proof, I tell you, that when people come against you, talk about you, scandalize you to your name. Listen, if hey, those of you who are out there in Facebook land watching this sermon and you happen to be scrolling and listening to this sermon, looking for somebody to hate on, here I am. My name is Walter Carter. I pastor Union Tabernacle Baptist Church under the power of the Holy Spirit. I preach out of the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of God. And if you're looking for somebody to hate Hate on, hate on me. I can take it because persecution is evidence that I belong to him. Ishmael at the weaning feast for Isaac made fun of old Isaac. And there are people that's going to make fun of you. When you're the child of promise, when the Lord has called you and qualified you and ordained you, you ought to be glad that somebody is thinking about you. Because in order to talk about you, they got to think about you. But that ain't nothing but proof positive that you must be doing something right. The persecution Christians face is not always from the world. I hate to make this announcement. I know y'all was just up a minute ago shouting. But the persecution, mother, that many of us face is from people right up in here. Up in here. That sometimes the people that attack you the most are not the people from the other team, but they're on your side. They're, they're supposed to be walking as you walk. And then they compare how you live with how they live as if their life is the standard. I don't cuss and drink. No more. I don't go out and have sex outside of marriage anymore. I am attracted to opposite sex. Uh, and even though I'm not married to them, that's still the way God intended it. Listen, baby, shut your mouth. Stop talking. You ain't the standard. The Hebrew writer said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the God. Listen, I want you to know that you are not the standard. Jesus is. Too many church people run folk away from the church because they don't act like you. They don't dress like you. They don't sing like you. You ain't all that, boo. I'm sorry, I didn't quit preaching and going to meddling, but I had to say it. Because there's too many sanctimonious church people acting as if their life and their way of living is the standard. And here, Jesus says, if you think you're the standard, then your mama's name is Hagar. So next time somebody comes to you and they begin to attack you and tell you what you ought to do and what you ought to be, you ought to ask them, how your mama doing? <laughs> yeah, just us ask them, how your mama doing? They're going to say, oh, my mama died six months ago. We ain't talking about that mama. We talking about Hagar because your mama name is Hagar because you living according to the law. I'm living according to the promise. I'm living by grace, not by works. I am glad that I'm saved, not because work that I've done, but because of what he did. Watch it now. He says that, that, that God told Abraham, to cast out the slave woman. I'm going to preach the whole thing if y'all don't mind. Uh, he says, cast out the slave woman. Watch it now. For 14 years, Sarah was able to deal with having this other woman who she sent to her husband in the house with a baby, receiving wife privileges and acknowledgement. She, she lived with it for a while. Yet, then God shows up and blesses her to the point of laughter. She gives birth to the child of promise. And let me tell you what Paul is saying that, that this part of Genesis is communicating to you and I. That there will come a time when that which you have tolerated for so long, you have to do away with. 
And that which you have tolerated was this bent towards legalism, law keeping, and living according to rituals and custom. But rather now, we have been saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ. And his work, his righteousness ought to be our first and only priority. That if you live righteously, it ought to be as an act of love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in order to earn that love because he's already given it to us. <laughs> this is love. And that while we were yet sinners, Lord have mercy, I'm trying to get happy now. Christ died for the ungodly. <laughs> God, Jesus is not coming back for righteous people. He's coming back for forgiven people. He is going to save you and bring you home to be with himself. Not because of the goodness of your own, but because of his grace and because of his mercy. Your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living this moment because of you. I want to thank you and save you too because your grace and mercy brought me through. Y'all ain't shouting because you don't forget what grace and mercy literally mean. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve and mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. And if you can't shout over grace then you ought to shout over mercy because you should have been dead sleeping in your grave. But all oh, that Lord Jesus made death behave. And if you should happen to die don't worry about it because the back door to the, to the cemetery has been unlocked. Jesus took the keys and put them in his pocket and he went on back to be with his father. And you and I, even though we're going to die because we sin, thank God that death sting has been removed. Hallelujah. Let me ask you another question. Who's your mama? <laughs> As you listen to this sermon, wherever you're watching it from, I, wanna, I want you to answer that question. Who is your mama? Are you the child of bondage? Or are you the child of freedom? I love the song. I'm free. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm free. No longer bound. No more chains holding me. My soul has been resting. It's just a blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm free. We are free. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I, I, I close. This week I went and saw a member of our church. I had to go through Memphis Tennessee, in order to drive to Farmerville, Louisiana, to see Mother Sally Davis. She, she needed someone to come alongside and prop her up. And so I, under the leading of the Holy Spirit, went there. But while I was in Memphis, I was blessed to have a mini vacation day. I took that day, and I went to the National Civil Rights Museum. Where is the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee, where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot? They were playing all of his speeches and all of those things, sermons that he preached, all as you walk throughout the. But when I got to the, been to the mountaintop, Lord have mercy. He 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 says, and this is how I want to close. He he says, I I know. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. He says, because I've been to the mountaintop. He said, I looked over <laughs> and I've seen the promised land. He said, I may not get there with you. But I do declare, Martin Luther King says, that we as a people will get to the promised land. But I want to tell you that, that I began to shout after I listened to that and I made my way to the I have a dream speech. Because now that I understand that the covenant that allows you and I to look over into the new Jerusalem gets us 
ultimate freedom that how he closes the I have a dream speech is how I'm closing the sermon here today. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God. Almighty. We are free at last. I'm not free because of the United States of America. I'm not free because of human effort. No, I'm free because of Jesus Christ. He paid my way. He bought my freedom. And now I live in the freedom that only he can provide. You and I are to live as children of freedom and not children of bondage. Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you for your word. We thank you for what it means to us. We thank you for your grace. We pray now, God, that you would stand in us, that you would help us to walk according to your word. Help us to receive the grace, the free gift that you have given us in order that we would live according to his righteousness. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you want to receive Jesus Christ and be set free, go ahead and type your name in the comments or send me a direct message. But I'm free. Praise the Lord. I'm free. I'm no longer bound. No more chains holding me. My soul is resting. It's just a blessing. It's just a blessing. You ought to be at your house praising the Lord. So praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm free. I'm free. Come on, sing. I am free. Praise the Lord. I'm free. No longer back. Oh, no longer back. No more change. No more change. Oh. Just Such a blessing. blessing. So praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm free. I'm free. Praise the Lord. I'm free. Oh, no longer back. Wave your hand. I'm free. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm free. Yeah. So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life 
And yes, you too can have everlasting life today. And that's what we offer you. We offer you an opportunity to make Christ your personal Lord and Savior, to accept him in your heart. And how do you do this? You admit that you are a sinner. Believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, and you shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the penalty of sin, saved from the power of sin, and one day ultimately saved from the presence of sin. List in the comments below. Let us know that you've made Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior or you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And someone from our hospitality ministry will get in contact with you to share with you and to welcome you into our family. Thank you so much.